My name is Alex Dorgen. I'm an Ansible specialist, and I'm going to be walking through the new automation platform containerized installer, which is a new way to install the automation platform onto a VM, but leveraging some containerized technology. So what's special about this new containerized installation and really why do I care? So if you've been leveraging the Ansible automation platform for a while, you probably are used to that virtual machine installer. And especially with all of the components that exist today between automation controller, the database automation hub and event driven Ansible, it's not exactly the quickest installation process. We also are leveraging Podman today already to manage the execution environments. So we looked into, can we also leverage that for the automation platform components? The answer is yes. So I can now run the Ansible automation platform on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux system, but leveraging Podman to manage the pods of the platform itself. So there are different pods for the different components for the web component, the API component, still to run the execution environments. So it really speeds up that installation process since all of the software is already installed in that container. Really the one of the longest parts of the installer is pulling down those containerized environments from registry.redhat.io, or I can leverage a bundled installer so they're already present. So really for me, just doing a fresh install took about six to eight minutes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how it can be longer, but this also leverages a non-root user. So I was using, in my case, my IDM user, conveniently a Dorgen, and I'm able to run the installer as that. Also, the entirety of the installation is run via an Ansible playbook. So there's no setup script anymore. It's all run via Ansible playbook, and I can leverage the typical variables that I'm used to. So I've um, Ansible vaulted every single one of my components for both the secure connections to the database as well as controller. And I've also vaulted all of my post deployment setup that I'll talk about again in a second. But this makes that process much easier to manage and install. Also, as I talk about, there are many components that exist now. Well, I can deploy all of those onto a single virtual machine. So instead of needing four VMs in order to have all the different components to test out, I could actually spin up one virtual machine leverage Podman to have all those different components, and then it maps it to three different ports. So 443, 444, and 445 for controller, automation hub, and event-driven Ansible controller. So I can have a single place to test all of these out in a sandbox environment. And honestly, that's where I would recommend leveraging this first. If you've got a sandbox or testing environment, or you just wanna test out some of the new components of the Ansible automation platform, I'd really recommend leveraging the containerized installer. Again, it's much easier, much quicker, but it is missing some of the capabilities of doing that backup and restore. So I can't currently do a backup of an existing virtual machine installed environment and restore this into the containerized environment. So just some things to keep in mind. But as we've added in this containerized installer, we've also added in new capabilities. So as part of that inventory, I can actually have it automatically add in the automation platform license during the installer. So I can immediately log into the UI and I can also use the uh, infrastructure collections that exist to actually go through the process of really preceding content. So if you've ever leveraged the validated content for controller configuration, it leverages that exact same collection inside this installer to really do the entirety of the automation platform. So I can set up LDAP settings or SAML settings so I can immediately log in as the correct users. I can have all of my credentials and job templates and projects pre-created so I can immediately from installation to login have a fully functioning automation platform environment. So as you'd expect, we still have a traditional inventory to set up the installer. So in this case, again, I can have all of these on the same fully qualified domain name. Key again is it needs to be a fully qualified domain name. You cannot use IP addresses for this. I can set up the registry to pull from registry.redat.io, or I can again leverage the bundled installer if I don't have external access. And then once again, I'm setting up all the usernames and passwords, which I can store in a separate file and leverage Ansible Vault to encrypt them, which I've done. Since I talked about that post installation process, there is a section that shows up for the controller post install and the controller license file. So I can take my existing manifest zip file, use that to automatically import that into controller during the installation. And then I can also either have an existing directory with all of my controller configuration or I can actually have a repository set up that I can pull from and leverage that for the post installation configuration. So I can really have out of the box controller fully configured automation hub with LDAP users set up because that's part of the inventory already. And then as this continues to grow, we'll look at ways that we can also set up automation hub and event driven Ansible controller as part of that installation. 
so I can really have a fully functioning environment right out of the box. So let's look at what this installation looks like and I'll also show really how I can take advantage of this once it's fully deployed. So let's walk through the installation process itself. So as you can see, I'm already logged into my RHEL 9 VM and I'm logged in as a non-root user. So in this case, I'm logged into myself. I'm leveraging an IDM user. You could leverage an Active Directory user or a local user, but I will in this case need pseudo privileges because there are a few packets that need to install both pre-installation as well as during the installation. As I talked about before, there is no setup script. It actually all just leverages Ansible for it. So I do need to make sure a few components are already there installed on that virtual machine. I've already pre-installed these, so you'll see that they're already available. And because the installer itself actually leverages a collection to do the installation, I do need to make sure I've set up the collection path for that. Amazingly, when I do that on tar, I'm not putting it into the default collections path. So I do need to set that to map with where I've got things. So I'll navigate into the folder that I've already untarred. Obviously you need to download and untar it into your environment. And then I'm just leveraging Ansible Playbook to actually run the installation. Because I'm leveraging Ansible Playbook, I can add in all those typical extra variables. So in this case, I'm using the inventory that I've built that I'll walk through in a minute. I'm leveraging that ansible.containerized installer collection that was pulled down with the installer. And then I'm using the install playbook. I'm passing in an extra variable for my secrets. So all the secrets for the passwords and the admin passwords and all that is encrypted. And then I'm using ask vault pass to actually ask for that decryption password so it can handle that full process. So now it's running through the installer itself, but let's switch over to the installation guide so I can see kind of what's contained there. So as I talked about, I do need a RHEL 9 host, in this case a RHEL 9.2, and I do need to be logged in as a non-root user with privileged escalation capability. So that's why I leveraged the user that I had. You can set up an SSH public key if you're connecting to multiple virtual machines. In my case, I just used the single virtual machine, so I used Ansible Connection Local. I'll walk through that in a minute when I walk through my inventory, but that was a fairly simple process. And then in my case, I did have internet access because I'm pulling my container images directly from registry.redhat.io, but it isn't necessary if you leveraged a bundled installer. The system requirements are very similar to what you saw for automation controller by itself, so 16 gigs of RAM for a CPU. Obviously, you need enough disk space for both the container images as well as the database, but not a massive requirement considering I'm running four components on this virtual machine. Then I do need to make sure that I have the RHEL 9 repositories enabled for both base OS and AppStream OS. So obviously, that's how I was able to download those particular packages. And it does install some additional components like Podman, which are available in the RHEL 9 repositories. You also need to make sure there's some sort of DNS and hostname resolution if I'm connecting to other hosts but you should also at least have the host name set for where the installer is running from, which it does talk through this process as well. So as you saw, I already did this process through the installation. My template for actually provisioning my RHEL 9 VM already sets all my host name and sets up DNS and all that for me, so I didn't really need to go through that process. You will need to download the installer, whether it's the containerized regular setup or the containerized bundled installer through access.redat.com. Note, you'll only see them under the 2.4 for RHEL 9 to actually have those installers. It's not available for any of the older versions of the automation platform or on RHEL 8. So make sure you look in those two sections to find the containerized setup. You'll see a tech preview note next to both of them. Then you do that untar process, set that collections path so I can actually do the installation. And then it really is you know, setting up all the other features. So if I wanna set up post install, I can but all that's maintained in the inventory. So I need to make sure I set up that inventory, which I'll walk through in a minute. And then it really is as simple as running Ansible Playbook with me in my inventory and that install playbook. The other nice thing about the containerized installer is A, it's all on one VM if I want with different ports, and there's actually an uninstallation process. So I can run that same playbook with the uninstall possibility, or I can run uninstall with some extra variables. So maybe I wanna keep the container images because well, you know, I'm gonna do uninstall and reinstall multiple times, so I don't wanna go through that process of pulling down the container images or anything like that. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in that process. But let's look at what my kind of installer looks like so I can make sure, yeah, I know kind of what's going on and what's available to me. But again, this doesn't need to be complicated as I go through this. So looking back at the actual directories, I can see I've got my inventory, I already have downloaded my manifest and I've Got that secrets.yaml, which has all my encrypted secrets, but let's jump into the inventory first. So this looks just like the standard inventory for the installer with the different group names. So automation controller, automation hub, automation EDA, and the database. 
just like the traditional installer, I can set as many or as few components as I want. So if I just want controller in the database, I can just set up those two. In my case, I want to have all three components to take advantage of what the possibilities are with the single containerized installer. And then there are some additional variables that I added in to make sure I have SSL certificates. And I added in an additional uh, client max body size because my collection that I publish has a larger file size than the default of one meg. So I built that into the installer to make sure everything is set up for me out of the box. Then obviously I want to make sure I'm using some additional capabilities of the installer, in this case, that post install. So I've got my you know, Postgres host set as usual, but from the optional side of things, I've got my license file specifically called out. I do have post install set to true, and I've got the directory set. I could have this set to pull from a GitHub URL into that directory, but in my case, I just have everything stored locally for now. I've also got my automation hub additional settings set up. So again, using that same Postgres host, but I've set up LDAP with the actual password for the bind user set up in that circuits.yaml. And then event-driven Ansible controllers also set up to use that same host with the controller URL. So all of this is set up with my inventory and I've got that secrets already set up, but let's look at that post install capability. So I do have that controller config in a separate repository or in this case, locally stored. And then I've got all my different files. I can have as many or as few of these as I want. And the names of the YAML files doesn't actually matter. What does matter is the variables that I have set in there. So I've, in this case, set up Ansible Vault to do this process for me just to keep everything encrypted. So I'm, let's, in this case, just look at my inventory. And it's specifically looking for this controller inventory's variable name. And then I've got a dictionary of what that looks like. So the different environments that I have set. So I've got a production environment, my local host inventory, and my service now inventory. I also have an inventory source tied to that. Or maybe I want to look at the job templates since that's generally a much more involved aspect for building out. So again, I've vaulted this piece of the uh, inventory, but this is looking at the controller templates. That's the specific name that it's looking for. And anything that, any check boxes that exist in the controller UI, obviously I can set it as a variable. I can set the specific inventory that I want to use, and I can even add in a survey. So it actually auto builds the survey with, you know, for my patching, I ask the end user what packages they may want to exclude. So it goes through that entire process, set up all these different pieces. And let's look back at my other terminal window to see if the installation is done. And it is, I can see that it did a whole bunch of changes, made sure all the organizations were set. So if I log into automation controller for the first time, I should be able to see a fully functioning automation platform. So normally the first time I log in, I would actually log in as the admin user, but I don't want to do that. I'm actually going to log in as myself because I am that IDM user with my username and password. And I should see a fully functioning automation platform. So I didn't have to put in my license. That was part of the installer. And you can see I already have 142 hosts, four inventories, 18 projects. I even have those custom credentials. I've got my custom organizations. All of this was part of the installation process. So I even have those templates all ready to go. So one of that job that I was looking at was my patch roll job with that survey. So this is the exact survey that I showed as I was walking through that. Same thing applies to Automation Hub. So again, I have LDAP set up for this so I can log in as my IDM user. There is no right now Automation Hub config to get this piece set up. So it is a blank environment, but you can see the possibilities with the controller configuration to also start populating in the remotes, sync those repositories, and all, all, have all that ready to go out of the box as well. And then I do have my EDA controller, which I could log into and leverage that. So I really have a fully functioning automation platform environment with a single virtual machine with a single installer that manages full process for me. So where can you go next? So I'm gonna include two blogs, one that walks through the idea of the containerized installer and then one that walks through that seeding content so the post installation process. I'll also include a link to the containerized installer itself to make sure you go to the automation platform 2.4 for RHEL 9, as well as that installation documentation that I walk through. All that will be included in the description down below, but I encourage you to take a chance to actually do this installation, get comfortable with the components, especially if you're on an older version of the automation platform and you haven't had a chance to take advantage of event-driven Ansible controller, or you want an easier way to test out some of these pieces and really have an out-of-the-box environment available to you, which I can leverage with that post-installation capability. So I hope this was helpful getting to learn a little bit more about what that containerized installer looks like, especially with that post-install capability. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.
Click the image on the left to watch another video or click my picture on the right to subscribe.